Buenos días para todos. Eh, les ofrecemos disculpas por eh, comenzar más tarde de, de lo que teníamos programado, pero pues para nosotros es un gran honor presentar al profesor de Bashis Chanda. El profesor de Bashis es profesor del Creol, que está adscrito a la Universidad Central de la Florida. Nos va a dar eh, el día de hoy, ahora esta sesión en la mañana, en la tarde y en los dos días siguientes en los horarios que ya hemos enviado los correos para eh, darnos una, un curso que nosotros esperamos a nosotros nos dé unas ventajas en el sentido de adquirir conocimientos y poderlos aplicar en diversos sectores empezando pues por sectores agrícolas sobre espectroscopía y sus aplicaciones eh, yo no voy a demorar más para nosotros es muy grato tener al profesor acá con nosotros esperamos no sea la última vez y ya muy bienvenido you are very welcome thank you This is a big sure uh, thank you uh, Anna for the invitation to uh, run a short course uh, so we're kind of running late actually so we'll try to um, do as much we can to make up the screen is very small Uh, I think we'll need to look for it uh, because it's very small to win. And also the pointer doesn't work very well. But again, we'll do our best. As I um, introduced, uh, let's see, um, just to, s you have to acknowledge where you come from. So that's the optics school, College of Optics and Photonics. And, uh, and then uh, this is more of institute uh, college. And this is uh, also a nanoscience technology center, another institute, some kind of cross appointed between them. And our tenure stays at uh, department, which is a physics department. So that's called tenure home, where I teach, uh, because as a professor, we're supposed to teach. So that's how we teach. And research is mostly here. And the plan is to kind of study light and the material. That's the plan, so that we can Leverage of this institute only focus on material studies, various kinds of material, uh, and here mostly lasers and light. So uh, people like me who are cross-appointed, uh, goal is to uh, study material with light. And that's kind of what we want to do today, to understand a material uh, just from outside, like how a material look like uh, just by looking through the eye of light. So basically how light interact, that will tell us Um, how this material, uh, or what type of material we're looking at. Just to briefly introduce uh, some of the research goes on in my lab, just to show that what I do for living, uh, because we have to do something for uh, government. So uh, we work on various uh, kinds of solar cell where um, optics plays a big role. Plan is to kind of trap light and make it very efficient cells, which actually can be portable, so that people can carry the solar uh, module uh, when they go. So that is a big thrust area to call portable power generation because many times um, there is a situation where there is no battery, uh, there is no uh, power supply. So can you generate locally power? So that's kind of a um, key goal is to create a very thin film um, cells which can trap photons and create high efficiency. A uh, lot of interest into um, a sensor uh, where we are looking at embedding sensor in the body and measuring through light. So one of the recent work we are actually worked on called uh, neurotransmitter detection means think about you have a brain injury and you cannot have access to say MRI. Like even now we have so many kind of uh, neural problem. We suffer from depression, Parkinson. Um, Alzheimer, but we cannot monitor very well brain because again it is kind of a invasive technique. People have to open the brain up, put some electrode or do some MRI which is expensive uh, and low throughput technique. So the plan is to do that can we do simple blood test like a plan we are trying to looking at take a blood and the blood itself has some neurotransmitter which monitors the brain and you can actually just measuring um, Uh, various neurotransmitter, um, we could actually uh, measure the brain activity. So that was the kind of a goal. <coughs> so anyway, I think we have more crowd people now. So just I was introducing um, uh, kind of some of the work we do uh, for living. So that's one of the work I think brings uh, optics and electronics people together that we need, we can use light to monitor health. 
uh, which is an important area for mankind to have a sensor implanted on your body or you could have a small chip you draw a drop of blood and you say uh, our major goal is now neurotransmitter to monitor brain activity so that's kind of a um, area we are kind of looking in uh, then another parallel work um, so uh, again ultimately goal is to use those sensor for health monitoring monitoring protein but we are looking in something called chiral light means when light interacts with some kind of those nanostructure surface it creates some chiral field means the light itself is handedness means light field rotates one we can control that rotation of the left circular versus the right circular so we actually create this field where the light itself rotates and now you can imagine each biological molecules are chiral our whole body, proteins, everything is made out of two-state molecule. The plan is to, if you drop a, a chiral molecule, it actually interacts very differently based on the light field. So, you, so now, if you don't follow anything and thinking that still not makes sense, just to give an example, this is a orange and lemon. This is a simple example because I give this talk to even to high school. As part of government, we use government money and we have to go each two, three months to high school give talks. So because that's just to show that orange and uh, lemon, this is a lemon, this is orange, exactly same molecule called lemonin. The, the, the length of the molecule, weight of the molecule, uh, thickness of the molecule, everything identical. That means there is no very easy way of detecting lemon and orange. Think about that. We go to Mars, but we cannot detect lemon and orange. Believe me or not, there is no technique directly. And you'll be laughing. Come on, a, a small kid know what is a lemon and orange, right? We can smell. So our human system is very complex. So only difference uh, in lemon and orange in that molecule, that one way is left twisted, another way is right twisted. So the molecule length, every aspect of the molecule is same. Only one is twisted left, one is twisted right. So when we smell a lemon or orange, our nasal system and brain has some way of, again, it's uncertain way, biologists still don't know exact how human brain can interpret a lemon and orange, that we have some way of chirality detection. When molecule goes through the smell of the orange and lemon, the brain somehow or the, our nasal system somehow has a way to know whether it is a left or is a right to stay. It's not easy. So, so that kind of gave us a quite a bit of a half a million dollar recently uh, from National Science Foundation to develop this kind of sensor where we create a strong near field light where it itself is rotating left or versus right. So depending on which one you choose, you drop lemon and orange, you interact differently. Because the field itself rotating, like you are creating a whirlpool, one going this way, another one this way, which I decide because based on my light and the design, I decide whether it be left or right. So if I know this is left, now I know I can only sense lemon. If you put orange, it gives the opposite signal. So I know it's a lemon and orange very accurately. Again, now question is, what is the main goal? Why don't we use that? So now use that now going back to our human body, as was mentioned, all protein molecules are chiral. Think about our DNA is chiral. So now a real example is a DNA defects, like a people, um, like a born with defects in the kids born with the defects in DNA and they get diseases like um, um, Asperger syndrome or the autistic. Autism is a big problem for kid. And only people detect the kid autism through behavioral change, means when kid behave differently, by the time he or she will be 10 years old or eight, nine years old, too late. You have to detect autism at the age of say one year, but there is no technique to detect autism at one year because they're kid. Whatever they do, their behavior, we think they are kid till they grow up. The question is, can I now detect their uh, uh, DNA defects? Again, DNA defects are also difficult to detect because it's simply change in twist. It's not easy to measure the change in twist. So, so this chiral optics kind of open up lots of opportunity to study um, uh, molecules and, um, uh, and, and develop sensor based on, which can only measure the direction of twist. So and, uh, uh, that's a more funded work. We kind of interested you to develop infrared eye for night vision. So you want to see in the night or you want to study some far galaxies. That's a big government funded area. And uh, recently, the last week I was on Nature interview. So Nature interviewed me on our recent work on a graphene based uh, new kinds of detector we developed. So that's what kind of got us kind of international name. But point is to that you use material so that you can actually um, uh, sense infrared light. That's kind of 
what we are talking about. Uh, that is again ongoing, uh, that is my startup company. So, they are kind of developed a technique to develop a display just based on the surface structure. And if you see, this is a very known uh, creature, but it can actually create such a wide range of color just based on structuring. It has no light source, no nothing. But can you make this one? Believe me or not, we are not even a 1% close making that one with all our sophisticated thing. We can go to Mars, cannot make a um, uh, chameleon, cannot, cannot, we just cannot. Our technology nowhere near to have anything closer to that. So that kind of makes us think because our displays are you can see in front of you, right? This is all, this is the state of the art, all displays, even in, in this one. It all has a hidden light, white light and have a filter. I am blocking preferentially red, green and blue light and that's for, that's create all the color, right? But question is this uh, chameleon or all kinds of natural uh, uh, animals, <coughs> octopus or uh, all of those actually use the surface structuring and use surrounding light. So, sunlight drives the display. So, they don't need battery. Think about, I always worry about, I'm pretty sure some of you also worry about when I travel, my battery may die. Then, then what to do? I feel, oh my God, I'll be lost somewhere in Cambodia. I was there like last few months ago in Cambodia and I have my phone almost dying. And I got a heart attack almost. Oh my God, I'm so far away, my phone dying. So the plan is to, just to give an example that can you create a very efficient way of displaying, but you're, you are not using energy. Our display takes so much energy that our phone dies quickly. So you can create very energy efficient display, use sunlight, use the room light. Think about the TV, not need any power, just using this white light to illuminate and it works fine. So your white light is a driving source. So you are using efficiency that way. That's kind of interesting, uh, more of a kid uh, curiosity started from. So I run multiple conferences all over the world, uh, just based on structural color. And uh, again, it's kind of interesting to develop. We made some progress, but again, not close to chameleon. I have to confess that. So while we do so, we, uh, because I always believe in that unless you make it, uh, that doesn't go very well. So making is very important for us. So while you understand, uh, do all the mathematics, study the physics, uh, do simulation, how it perform, but eventually make it. So that's the ultimate goal. And that actually needs very different approaches because you can see that they are not a very planar substrates or planar platform. They are not a phone, flat. So the question is, uh, they are very complex curvilinear planes. So normal fabrication technique or normal um, cheap making or normal technique doesn't work. So you need to think about can you make it bendable, stretchable, you know, conformably mappable. So most of the stuff we do uh, need a different approach or different thought process to make it work. So that's what kind of, so that kind of summarizes some of the research we do and some of them we do for fun. This is mostly do for fun, but kind of nice, a uh, lot of interest into the industry, uh, just got funded through um, Mark Germany, L'Oreal and Tesla. Uh, for my startup company in California. So they are kind of trying to go to commercialization out of my lab. So that's kind of, uh, now that going back to uh, today's uh, thing that we planned and promised to talk about spectroscopy. And you will see that uh, without um, knowing spectroscopy, nothing can be done. Like we need to understand material and the device and light, it gives us that ability. So that's kind of sets the tone that even the a device look like that, but without knowing how light going to interact inside, we don't know um, how they're make up. So just to give an example, that thing we'll be talking about, like a sending a light on a material and how that light comes out of the material and create some spectral signature, it means it creates some uh, uh, fingerprints of that material. So that kind of what will be behind. So that's a nutshell. If you have to say one slide of the whole thing we're going to talk about, this is the only thing we'll be talking about. But you look like that, that it has many variable. We'll be looking through what type of light source, whether it is a UV visible source, whether infrared source, or the laser. So that actually covers almost 70% of the all spectroscopy. So there, and that determines what type of material you are looking at, uh, what are the signature you are looking. Uh, so that de determined by this um, source, how you are going to illuminate, what light you are using. You use a coherent light, incoherent light, infrared or into the low energy or high energy. So those kind of determines uh, what type of material uh, we will be able to 
uh, see and uh, what we see also and you can you can see that we'll be looking through various resonances you see the resonance peaks means that when light excites those material it, it, it create a lot of resonances so those are the resonances is very specific to a uh, molecule and given an example that we all have our own resonances right we if, as a person we feel excited about something what I feel excited about you may not feel excited about right so that's something uh, each material is very unique and we'll try to see that how to uniquely identify so there will be some aspect some will be common thing like we all like to eat in general we'll, we in general human or any animal like to eat this is a very common trait but then if you have to make a very unique about say Anna we have to go specifically send a light which speaks out what Anna likes to eat very specifically maybe arepa made in in Medellin. So then we have to use a specific light. That means a general light gives you that we all like food. But then you go to a particular peak, oh my god, that vibrational resonance is very specific to her. No other person has that characteristic. So that's what we could be. We'll look for a general way of characterizing and then we'll go to very specific um, uh, resonances. So again, that was the plan. So we have to be kind of, was kind of spread over three days. Uh, so that's a plan, but I think we are running quite late uh, in the time. So we'll try our best um, to cover. So the plan is to just go general introduction about uh, optical spectroscopy, uh, how it is being done, uh, do some UVV kind of spectroscopy, uh, then do some FTIR, which is more advanced. That's kind of interesting part of it. Uh, and this is a Raman spectroscopy. It's very specific. It, it identifies molecule based on some specific resonances. So that's kind of lead us to there and then this is a, a completely new kind of emerging field still not very popular but that's called near field scanning electron uh, scanning uh, spectroscopy and we'll see that with that we can not only resolve it characteristic spectrally but also spatially it means we can measure the molecule as very as a function of space and also time uh, that's what we'll be doing uh, and then that's what kind of lead us to a more pump probe setup what I mentioned in the want to capture time uh, also, so that's kind of pump probe setup, and then this is a nice part of the application where I think uh, we'll show some uh, how this pl pl spectroscopy can be used. I, ch I chose randomly some very simple example of instead we could have gone to some quantum state measurement, but that doesn't really help uh, uh, much uh, because I myself don't believe. Uh, but these are the very something you can actually see that how to identify say plastics or pesticide, food quality assessment. Those are very relevant for the society. Uh, so that's something we'll be talking about. And then if time permits, we talk about how to build a small handle spectrometer from scratch. That's a kind of, um, if time permits, we'll kind of go through that. So that's a kind of plan, but we'll see how far we can can go but anyway I think the plan is to you can stop me at any point you want because you know uh, for me it will be difficult I can continue talking about it uh, but I don't know how much um, uh, getting and also I cannot speak Spanish so I can say hablo no espanol so kind of um, I have to acknowledge that so you have to stop me and you can make it more uh, interactive and you can explain because many times um, it's difficult to know uh, something maybe I, I said but you never understood what I meant so it's better to stop and again it's kind of informal you can slowly kind of talk over and see anything you get out of it is kind of important that's I think uh, if you can go all this basic concept and know how to build your own spectrometer you you learn something out of it that's I think you can even go to any company and give a good interview and get a job at that's a bare minimum you can do because you know how to build a spectrometer that's that itself is a big goal if you can do so because he, Plan. I don't know that I can get to that on the third day because we developed our biggest problem of infrared detection. Again, I touch upon the detector. We don't have uh, very much detector and that's my research goal and we work on detector uh, from material. That's my 70% of the research in my group. So we develop a lot of detectors. Our goal is to use our own detector, make our own handle spectrometer so that I can, we can give it to say $100 spectrometer. You cannot buy $100 spectrometer. Biggest problem of the field, they're so expensive. This one will cost you a good one from, uh, um, uh, from uh, say, Brooker Optics will cost you somewhere around $200,000 to $300,000. Again, you cannot ask a farmer or a 
a small business uh, doing, uh, say, growing coffee and ask them to buy a $300,000 spectrometer for doing things. And I will show you that I, we actually collect a spectrum sample from here and we show you some nice data what we measured in our lab. Oh, you, uh, somewhere here, we we'll go there. So the plan is to, we have to reach up to that point. So we have to kind of some point accelerate a little bit. So we we'll start with a very basic um, way of understanding the spectroscopy, what people do in the UV to a visible domain, like a normal light, you can see. And just to touch base, uh, how it look like, uh, that's kind of spectral range you are looking at uh, from near UV around 400 nanometer to about IR domain about 700 to 800 nanometer. That's a kind of visible spectrum. So human eye can barely see 700 nanometer. That's kind of our eye can see. This is what we can see around 400 nanometer. Uh, I think some people can see about 390, 380, and that's somewhere some people ends there. So that's our domain of visible, visible light. So the point here we have to understand that this energy is quite strong because wavelength is shorter and energy is very strong. Um, uh, so basically it, it refers to electronic transition. Again, we'll define what electronic transition means that, um, uh, that it qualifies a light matter interaction in the region of electron spectrum where, where electronic transition means we can make it a molecule go from a conduction by valence band to conduction band. Again, we'll kind of see. So just to show that we have to remember that this is the electronic transition driven because the energy is very high. You can see that UV light is very high, right? If you go to sun outside, you get a sunburn. You go to beach, you get sunburn, right? They are very straight away. But also people get sunburned, people don't understand. Like they put lots of uh, shades on a uh, beach. Uh, they still see black, they come brown when they come back. You know why? Because they are sitting on a sand and sand absorbing UV light and they are re-radiating infrared light. Even in a, sh in a shade, you are getting this e indirect emission continuously. So when you come back from Miami Beach or in Orlando, many beach actually, both sides, um, Atlantic and so I, oh, some people uh, say, why, somebody asked me why I have shade all the time, the big umbrella we rented, but still I came back tan, what happened? I said, look, that is a physics is that you are sitting on a sand everywhere. Those are the emitter. Your sunlight, this spectrum getting absorbed by the uh, sand and continuously re-radiating at longer wavelength, which human eye cannot see. Somewhere one micron to say 100 micron, human eye cannot see. And you are getting that continuously and getting a burn. And you can try that with a small, some cloth and, and have a sh thing and spend the whole day on the beach. You'll, you'll get that. So the point here is that, uh, but those are much longer wavelength. Here we are talking about direct, means you go to the beach, no umbrella, you are taking this heat. This is the, what you are getting. Your molecules are getting such a high energy that you get sunburn because you are making electron transition and your melanin on the skin getting black. Uh, that's a, a direct transition of electronic transition based one. So now how a very simple basic spectrometer look like. So a basic spectrometer and again a plan is to just to highlight spectrometer means we need to give many wavelength of light. So again I think I should go back here that to get this spectrum what it is saying we are measuring the light bouncing out of this surface or the sample is a function of frequency. It means we are giving various color of light, blue, gray, red, yellow, all kinds of light we are sending and measuring them and trying to see how much red light came back, how much blue light came back, how much green light came back. So we have to have a dispersion. So we have to measure the material um, as a function of uh, wavelength. Means we have to send different color of light. That's the whole point. And just to show how to create, so typically a cheap light source, white light it generates, uh, and then you just use optics to catch that light because otherwise the incoherent light will go everywhere. So you have to use a lens to capture and then use a, some kind of grating or prism to disperse. You know, prism make the light uh, separated into uh, rainbow. So now you capture the rainbow. So now you can actually use a slit to sequentially move the slit and that's your sample and keep measuring. You measure point 0.2, move to green, Point 0.1, move to um, yellow uh, or, or, or blue, made point 0.4. So you keep recording how much light go through as a function of color. That's the basic. So you, every spectrometer has these comp three components. One is a light source, 
one is a dispersive material like a grating or a prism both are used actually you can use to spread out the light and then you measure now take that light because otherwise you can think about that and instead of having a, a white light can I use all colored light yes possible you can have green red yellow but then question is you run out of idea how many light source you need many light source in principle so instead of that you can take a white light and divide spectrally separate them and make that light go through your material and you measure this is just a simple transmission measurement but you can imagine you can do through reflection also many material has no transmission so most of many times we do a lot of reflection based so you can actually reflect that light and measure here so doesn't matter this is called transmission spectroscopy or, or many of those who do reflection spectroscopy so both can be done so those are the kind of component you need a source a monochromator which separates the light into components prism or grating your sample compartment where you hold your sample a photo detector is very important which measure the amount of light it going through uh, so basically you measure the yellow light with and without sample you remove the sample you send the light go through and measure so maybe 0.8 means 80 percent of light came through and then you put your sample back it sample absorbs some of the light and it's a point to come back. So basically now your point to divide by point eight is your. Uh, what is the effect of the sample solution of the light? Sorry? What is the effect of the sample solution in the light? Oh, the sample solution. So this is just solution, uh, but, uh, but then you can have a um, even solid sample too, like you have a piece of glass or piece of silicon. Uh, so your question was, what is the relation of concentration? Concentration of a solution? Oh, oh, that's true. Huh? Very good question. Yeah. So yeah. So that light get absorbed. Yeah. So that's light get like a remaining portion of the light get absorbed inside. Most of the cases. So that's a general terminology. Can also get scattered. So we'll. So there are multiple phenomena. We'll go through Raman scattering where we'll talk about that. We have a material. Light goes through. It can get absorbed and remaining can be scattered. Scattered means it can forward scattered means transmission or it could be back scattered means some of the photon just comes other side. But in this kind of scenario is all absorption. This is UVVs because I, I was mentioning uh, if I go back here that these energies are much higher. That's your sun burning energy, UV to visible light. That's, that's the energy, it burns your skin. So that's an electronic transition. Means you make material to absorb you, not scattering, it's simply absorbing you. And again, we have a. Right. This is what, if you come to my lab, we have simple for high school student. Yeah. Yeah, but we have. But, but it's, 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 uh, I, I, I can find the, the light, the prisma. Prism. Can they have some special? Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, but the, the option, or sea, I don't know how to say that. How can uh, make a measure of the light that I, I can receive? This is a, you need a detector. You need a photo detector. It's, it's it's Photo detector, a, a simple silicon photo detector, Thor lab, it sells you maybe three, four hundred dollar, maybe two hundred dollar. So this one will be hundred dollar, this is fifty two hundred dollar, this is uh, twenty dollar, uh, this is uh, three, four hundred dollar. We are looking at five, six hundred dollar, uh, we can have a setup. So I have, I have, because for my, uh, I have a, this setup, I have a, all kinds of spectrometer. This is for the high school kid. We bring them over and they play. They actually change the prism angle and, and measure how, how that changes as a function of. So, but it's very easy to build. And again, I'll show you, if you stick to the last day, I'll show you that how we build our spectrometer. 
Uh, that's a good question, though. Uh, anyway, so now, just to p make people interested, you know, sometimes we will uh, we'll go to some explanation, too. Like, but the question, some people will think, you know what, what is a use? So use, you can understand a lot of use, like a lot of diseases, like a, a functional um, groups, like a, you have a ammonia and you may ammonium hydroxide. Those functional group has different absorption spectrum. You can identify the functional group and the chemical processes. Um, defective impurities means a lot of time um, uh, material has impurities like a silicon has boron in it. You dope it with boron or phosphorus. Uh, so you can actually identify the impurities because they will have different spectral response compared to the normal your uh, base material. Uh, then a lot of compounds you can actually uh, like a lot of drug design has many compounds. So each compound has a different way of absorbing light and it creates that different spectrum. Again, we'll come to a minute. Uh, you can do a lot of liquid chromatography means you can actually, uh, you have a liquid chromatography, if you never followed that, means you have a mix of liquid. Think very basic example would be your blood. So your blood actually has a plasma and red burst particle, right? And many times for your detection, you have to separate plasma and the red burst particle. Think about uh, Medellin River has so many like a debris and uh, pollution going around. If you want to separate them, you want to water go other way and all the debris and the pollution, the plastic go other way, right? So how to monitor it? You cannot ask somebody to just sit back and keep looking at the river till everything goes. You need to automate it, right? So you can actually do liquid chromatography, means you can separate liquid and you can monitor because each liquid has different absorption. So by that, you can actually understand how good your filtration process and again, drug uh, spectroscopy plays without spectroscopy, we will not living this world today where we have a treatment because drug companies has to really understand compound at a very finite level. Otherwise, we'll be, um, uh, so th there's a very common drug problem which actually we are doing called tryptophan. Tryptophan actually used um, for, um, say, women's um, uh, pregnancy during morning sickness. But it, and the same molecule, it, it, when it's left circularly rotated, it, it helps the morning sickness. But if you have a right circularly rotated, it creates bad, bad defect in the babies. So think about the company stake. They are selling a drug which can have taken by woman and could have a catastrophic effect. Even a few percent left in the screening process of, say again, I, I introduced between lemon and orange because I like this problem and uh, that's what I got funded to, to government because I said, look, this is we need to solve it. We cannot leave drug companies to really worry about the health if you cannot provide them a technology. So I'm saying uh, uh, drug designing and spectroscopy plays a big role. Now back to the, okay. Uh, can I identify uh, inorganic compounds? Yes. Uh, yeah, all kinds of compounds. There's no molecule. I don't know that people cannot uh, identify now. Since all molecules can be identified very accurately. So now going back to the principle, because we need to go back and understand the, the physics, what will be kind of behind. So, so that is a very principle of the, this is your material. So you eat all the electrons are into the uh, valence band because they are tied to the crystal, the lattice and the ionic core hold them uh, and then you want to make them, uh, when you give them enough energy, you can liberate them, like you can go to the excited state or conduction band and all, you can completely relieve them. So, but it, when you excite with a light, means your light coming in, that's your light energy, you give into a material, this is simply a material, uh, we are saying that material, a ground state, all the electrons are nicely uh, held onto the valence band, there is nothing onto the Electrons means they are not energetic anymore. Uh, now you excite with the electron, you see that material hot, heat up, right? They become hotter because now my electrons are getting, uh, electrons absorb the photons uh, and then go to higher energy state. So now electron instead of here, they move down here. And that has to match. Means my light energy, because energy has to be matched. Somehow universe, the person or the, the I don't know, God or whoever designed. So that's the universal rule the incident energy has to be matched. So this is the energy I am giving with light. This is what it is. This is a green, blue green photon here. And that has to be matched by the energy absorbed by the material, which is my delta E. So again, very, very basic. Uh, it is uh, developed long time ago that this is, has to be preserved. 
So now I create an excited state. That means I absorbed energy. That means that light, if I put a material and light going through it, that energy not coming back because that light getting absorbed completely in the material. And that energy will be heating up. So because most of the time, the electron goes here and keep falling down, called vibrational level. So electron keep electron cannot stay excited state like we cannot stay then material will deteriorate we cannot stay in excited state has to come back eventually so it will fall down eventually that energy so it will create heat because it it will cascade through these vibrational states so what is the bottom line I excite a material with light and light getting absorbed right that is a mechanism. And then eventually that energy, the extra energy electron, the electron has energy E1 or E2 and now it jumped to a E1 level. And that, that energy difference of electron should be supplied by the light. That is my light energy, H bar nu. Is there any difference between irrational energy and translational energy or is the same? Irrational energy. Translational energy and Rational energy. Transnational energy and another one you said? Vibrational. Huh? Oh, vibrational. Very good, yeah. Vibrational energy, right. So that's a vibrational energy band. You see that this is this is the energy bands and we'll talk about vibration in a because we'll go to Fourier transform spectroscopy, we'll talk about vibration means molecule just stretches and bends. This is electronic transition, means your molecule electrons go from a low energy state to jump to high energy state. Like you think about you are comes coming down now and then we do something and you get very excited suddenly. So that's your excited state. And then eventually you will come down, like electrons falls down and material goes to ground state again. But that's called electronic transition. And these are the wide band gap and that you need a high energy photon. That's the reason I spoke that you need UV and visible domain where light is very strong. You, you, you can only excite that transition, electronic transition that. But now if, if, if energy is very small, you don't do that. You do this. You are just stretching the molecule. You are absorbing, stretching, bending, rotation. And that's what it is. Uh, electronic transition, vibrational transition, and rotational. Rotational means molecules start rotating. In. And again, we'll, we'll talk about when you go there. So you can see that the total energy, you know, this is a general expression that you excite some electronic transition, do a vibrational transition. It can happen, but many times these two happen, doesn't happen. Only this happen and that and or these two happen. But this is a general expression that if the photon energy you give, if it matches the band gap, it excites and then the remaining energy can be coupled to the vibrational and rotational. And typically electronic energy need is much bigger than uh, vibrational and rotational uh, 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 energy. So that's what the basic principle uh, of, um, of, of, of uh, any, any UV visible space. Yeah, so we'll talk about the, the, this, this thing specifically when you go there. This just to setting the line. But now going a little bit farther ahead in the process that these transitions that are multiple type of transitions uh, can happen between bonding and anti-bonding means when electron can bond to each other. So you can actually go from sigma to sigma star. So go to sigma to sigma star or you can go from pi to pi star. You can go from pi to pi star or n to pi star, n to pi star or pi n to uh, sigma um, sigma star but there are some transitions which are not allowed so the, again the, again going back to basic there are Pauli exclusion principle allows that the momentum also has to be matched and not all transitions are allowed so that's what kind of summarize it here that some of the transitions are allowed and I just put some different color and you can see there are different energy because the depending on the band gap uh, but some of the transitions so you cannot go from a sigma uh, to pi star anti bonding you cannot go from uh, bonding to anti bonding there is no transition allowed um, or you can go from say pi to pi stars you cannot go from pi to uh, say sigma star there is no transition yes that is a good so question Right, so I don't have the slide to Pauli exclusion principle to explain, but the point is that uh, when you make a transition, not only energy, but also the momentum has to be matched. 
So many transition, even electron has higher energy but cannot couple to. Now to give a high school example, you are on a railway station and a train moving in front of you started. And this is my example. I, when I was in India, I did my undergraduate study there. Each day morning I should catch a train and each day I come late to the station and each day train will be almost leaving and I used to jump into the train. So you can, most cases when it's slow, when you see a train moving faster, even if you are running, there's a huge mismatch of momentum. You cannot jump it. So that's what happened. Electron ha is energetic, but it cannot catch to the next level because it's faster than. So there's a big momentum mismatch. That's kind of. But, but sometimes I, uh, I can see this kind of transition. Right. Very good. That's a good point. He said that it's possible. Like your thing, you're, you're, you decided to jump into the train with the risk of your life. That's what they call it. it. means point is that that is uh, called defect states, which actually helps. The electron cannot catch to that band anymore. But there's a defect state sitting there. It, it makes this momentum transfer. It goes and collides with that defect, some molecule missing, lattice mismatch. And it, it collides with that defect and bends such a way that it again can couple to. In some cases, it does happen that you can uh, have this kind of forbidden transition. But most cases, you, you will not be. Uh, that's kind of a very interesting uh, uh, question. Uh, just to give an example, we can pick and just to, uh, just because you, without uh, having an example uh, will not make sense. So now we talk about sigma electron from a bonding orbital is excited to anti-bonding sigma star. Like we are going from a sigma to sigma star transition. And the very common example is a methane has CH bond and, uh, and undergoes this kind of transition. So methane does this kind of transition and you can see uh, even again, this is not the class to understand all the band, band structure, which is a very separate topic, uh, which will take us wrong other direction. But uh, just to give an example, like a methane can make this transition from sigma to sigma star, and you can see the huge band gap. Longer the wider the band gap has to be shorter wavelength, right? Because inverse relation of uh, energy and wavelength. So you need a shorter, so that you can look only 120 nanometer light you need which is very deep into the UV uh, to excite a methane to, um, uh, or, or, or do anything with methane, measure methane. So you need a very shorter wavelength of light because such a wide band gap. And then another example is to give a go from a pi to pi star. That's my pi to going to, a, uh, uh, to pi star bonding to anti-bonding state. And so a lot of compound like uh, alkyne, carbyl, nitrides, very much aromatic molecules, like you are mentioning about um, organic molecules, those are all organic molecules. Aromatic means you smell all this aroma. So they all go this kind of transition from pi to pi star. And again, you can see quite broad, but it is not at broad like a sigma to sigma star. And so wavelength become little longer, 170 to uh, about 200 nanometer uh, range of light. So back to your question. So you need to know which material organic you are want to probe. You have to choose your light accordingly, right? You are you choose a light from 400 nanometer, and you are saying, okay, I cannot, I cannot measure methane. I cannot measure any of my nitriles, carbyls, or alkynes. I cannot because you are farther. You are not exciting. You have to match this, right? You have to you have to go back and match this energy relation. So to match that, you need to know uh, where, which bond, which, where the electrons are and how can, which, where, which one goes to which where. So you have to kind of know your spectral range to measure your, uh, then N2 pi star same way, N2 uh, sigma star, N2 sigma star, this. Uh, and then you can see that it's kind of comparable to the, the previous one, so we're kind of looking at two, uh, 150 to 250 nanometer uh, in the UV uh, domain. And then uh, lots of molecule like um, uh, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, halogens, they all kind of do this kind of N2 sigma star uh, transition. That means anything to do with oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, halogen, uh, you need a UV source which goes 250 nanometer or below. So that kind of says, I'm trying to say again, we don't have to remember everything, I'm trying to say that where you do spectroscopy, you need to know where your material is absorbing. You, otherwise, you will be looking somewhere, your material not present, not doesn't see that light. So you have to match the band gap. Uh, so again, that's a kind of oxygen, methyl chloride, water, ethanol, all actually do uh, this transition. 
uh, again this is another one to go from n to pi stars n to pi star little shorter a little shorter in lower in energy means longer in wavelength so you need about 300 nanometer light uh, to examine uh, these bonds like uh, carbon oxygen bond carbon nitrogen bond nitrogen oxygen bonds so basically you have a molecule which has these bonds and you want to do uv spectroscopy you need to measure around 300 nanometer and you see these are very common bonds actually many molecules has carbon oxygen bond carbon nitrogen bond and uh, uh, nitrogen oxygen bonds and again I was mentioning that some of the bonds are forbidden uh, only theoretically possible as was mentioning sometime you can see uh, those transition theoretically um, 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 uh, but in practicality uh, most cases you will not show um, those bond uh, those uh, transition now that kind of little touch upon upon on the band structure of absorption but now these are the very grounding this this is a very important slide for any um, uh, UV visible wave spectroscopy called Beard Lambert's law so this is a, a very important talk in that means that Beard law says that your because I th and it's very important because you're sending um, a uh, I think I always like to use the board uh, so you are actually having a material let's think about liquid and it has molecules sitting there and it's a common sense you're sending light here with a hundred percent of light and you are measuring some light I don't know um, question mark so now you can understand that how much light will appear here depends on the concentration C this molecule present and also the path length L right makes sense because light has to traverse and it, if you encounter more molecule, uh, it, it get absorbed, the transmission is less. So basically I'm saying, for me, this is black box. I don't know anything about the molecular concentration. I only measure this one because this is my uh, observable. That is I measure. This is I don't know. Well, I'm trying to say that if I know this one, I can find out this one and one of them. So basically you need to know one of them. If you know this one, this is I measure. I know my thickness of the material, I know this one, I can find out C. Or this is always known, you know the concentration and you know, don't know the path length, you can find out L. And that is very interesting way of studying a material that, that it says the decrease in the intensity of a monochromatic radiation happens exponentially with the increase in concentration of the absorbing substance. Means we can see that the, the decrease of this uh, intensity is proportional to the delta C means uh, I think another way of writing that this is your intensity I going through and each time it is going inside it is losing intensity with um, from good minus into plus into going slowly intensity going down plot intensity this is intensity of light goes down as, as you go farther inside so this intensity delta l or oh sorry delta i by i proportional to delta c means the concentration is looking through so that's the beer's law says means uh, more the concentration quickly like more less light you will observe means more light will get absorbed on the material so that's a Beard law. Beard's law saying that means that a denser or concentrated uh, substance will absorb more light because the delta I is directly proper. You can take delta C to this side, direct proportional between delta I and delta C. And this is a normalization. This is simply the constant I started with. So that's not very playing a role. Delta I proportional delta C. That's my Beard's law. Now go to the next one, the Lambert's law. It says that delta I also proportional to delta L means my delta I, which is my ch loss in intensity while light propagates, is proportional to my delta L means path length. So now if you have both, you combine them to your famous Beer's Lambda, uh, Lambert law, which says that absorption of light proportional to con concentration and and, and the path length. So this is your concentration, path length, the thickness, and this is the molar absorption. This is the co absorption coefficient. So it is saying that light absorption A is 
proportional to CL, concentration path length. And you can write, just write equal to CL, where this is your proportionality constant Absor or absorption coefficient. That's what uh, kind of, so basically um, just by measuring, we'll be measuring absorption and then from that you can find out C if I know L and uh, vice versa. That's kind of um, what will be. Yes. Right. Right. So we'll, we'll, we'll come to the next slide and talk about what are the conditions for bear lambert law. So I thought, yeah, so conditions, so we'll talk about in a minute. What are the conditions to measure correctly? I knew that you'll be asking, so I put this slide. So it says that absorbing medium must be homogeneous in the interaction volume. Means it has to be homogeneous. All over concentration should be C. Now think about if concentration is denser here and slowly getting varying across, then this is this equation doesn't hold good because it's, it, it, concentration is not constant. So it has to be homogeneous. First, second, absorbing medium must not scatter the radiation. No turbidity means it should not scatter because we assume that light getting absorbed. But now if they start scattering, then I will think this is absorption because when I measure my T, which is my transmission, what a transmission means, you remember how much light coming here is actually 1 minus intensity. So 1 minus, so basically I'm writing T plus A equal to I. I think this is a nice way of writing. So this is my total light I'm giving here. Some of the light getting absorbed here and some of the transmitted. So absorb plus transmission equal to my total intensity. But one component I'm not adding is my reflection or scattering plus R equal to I. So this could be a scattering, you can write scattering. So this is the thing because I'm not measuring that one. I, I am measuring, this is I know, my power of light I'm sending, incident light, my light bulb by, uh, this is my, light bulb. So I know my uh, in incident light. I measure with the photo detector my transmitted light. And if I know this, I know this, I can find out A. But now if there is a reflection which is I'm not measuring or scattering means light scattered back, then my this assumption is wrong, right? So that means if there is some uh, scattering object flying inside which scattered light back, this equation will not give you very accurate C and L measurement. So, no uh, scattering. And the incident radiation must consist of parallel rays, each traversing same length through the, okay, that was a good point. As you said, your thing will not work out. And I said that we need to collimate. If you remember the spectrometer I showed before, because this is the incoherent light sends the light every direction, the K vectors every direction. You have to make them parallel, collimate the beam. Otherwise, you, you send light every direction and you not capture all of them, right? So you have to kind of collimate the, uh, so that, because ultimately we have to use this formula, right? A, C, L, and means, now think about a light going this goes to L, a light goes this, it goes to L1, a light goes this goes to L2. So this doesn't valid, make sense? It has to be collimated beam. Every portion of the photon goes to same distance. Otherwise, a diverging beam will go various direction and uh, you may not be able to um, uh, accurately predict um, your concentration or path length. And a incident radiation should preferably be monochromatic because this is based on a monochromatic, means one color. Because you, our goal for beard lambert law to find out this and this. If you have a many different wavelength of light, they get absorbed differently. And this absorption coefficient is a function, maybe a function of, because why I'm saying that most material as N is a function of lambda. Means N and K are function of lambda. Means they are dispersive. Many material is dispersive. Means their optical property change based on the illumination of light. So 
if you want to your goal is to bear Lambert law to find out concentration or path length you better be sending one light one color collimate with that make sure you have a homogeneous medium then you can use it that is about these are the kind of boundary conditions of using Baird Lambert's law make sense uh, again just to touch base uh, same picture I copy just to show remind ourselves that's what we talked about we need to have a source Need to make it collimated and then disperse it because we this is for the normal spectrometer but if you want to do beard lambert now you, you just pick one one wavelength and do everything and find out concentration length so you have to stick with one so you just pick one color and then calculate your uh, so now just to show some of the real alignment of the picture uh, that uh, typically they come with a source and then a lens to collimate the beam uh, objective lens again further collimate uh, focus the beam and then that grating disperse make the each color go with different angle uh, and then that's your um, um, uh, slit uh, and then you put your sample here and put a photo detector so similar same other arrangement but it is more of a realistic optical path it look like so you can actually this slit actually light control so that actually moves so this you have to move the slit right to choose your software knows which color coming to a detector so it actually moves the the uh, stage actually moves uh, and it knows angular spread so it knows uh, how much ang uh, distance it has to go to catch a red a orange and yellow green blue purple so it knows it so it goes that and you then you plot the, uh, the the measured light through the photo detector as a function of the color because and color is basically position of your your slit Make sense? Hope I'm not making you guys sleep. Um, so, so now uh, then a simple example will be another more a little advanced uh, example will be a double beam uh, spectrometer uh, because uh, as I was mentioning, our goal is to measure the molecule, right? The molecule I just draw crosses. So to do so, I have to do the referencing. Means I have a water or any solvent without that molecule. So I measure everything, transmission, measure transmission, and then I add those molecules and measure transmission T1 versus T2. And that the ratio of T1 may be called ref, reference. So T1 versus T ref. That's what I'm behind. I'm comparing with respect to reference. Because I don't want to get any information about the solvent. I'm behind organic molecules. So I have a liquid, so maybe acetone, and I add some uh, organic molecule in it. So they're floating. And I, uh, my job is to find out their concentration. I'm not behind this background. So before you do so, you have to do referencing called background subtraction. So that's what you have a two. Now you can do with one. So you can do one at a time. You can do one at a time. But many times it becomes a problem because you need to do many spectral measurement. Each time you have to reference it. So you, what you do called double beam. You have already parallel reference beam. Same light split into um, uh, two paths and one goes to reference path and one goes to your sample path. So that way you measure right away. So you get the measurement. So you, the computer takes this measurement divide by I divide by I naught gives you the uh, spectral response as a function of lambda. So you reference all the time. So you, you don't have to just put the two by and mostly for the for spectrometers in the um, drug industries or chemical factories uh, uh, run through uh, low skill labor uh, low sk in the subjective terminology like uh, people who are not very skilled like they're not educated they don't know beard lambert law and all these details about how band structure work they they cannot they will be mi mi making mistake each time putting a referencing so they actually they, they solidly put a reference there all the time and then your job will be to each day come in the morning put the sample in the chamber and measure because the uh, uh, a drug design company they cannot take a risk of making a wrong mistake uh, because then there are millions of medicine on the market with the wrong molecules so they they cannot so they put they make sure that that guy never touches the reference path the reference path controls the measurement because your eye not is measured wrongly your eye will be measured wrongly because you need to have some matrix some material to hold your molecule Mo molecules cannot hang on to th thin air you need something so that what is that something also a spectral response. I don't want to see that. I want to subtract this thing out. I don't want to see water response. My job is to find out sugar con concentration in water. 
So why do I bother about water? So I subtract water spectra out. So this is your water spectrum. So, and you measure water plus sugar and you subtract water, sugar minus water, you get sugar back. That's the whole plan. Make sense? It, the simple kind of picture, this is not very sophisticated, less kind of a double beam uh, uh, kind of spectrometer, I'm pretty sure you guys have on the campus. Uh, so again, that's what it kind of look like after do all of those. You measure intensity as a function of lambda. That's what we are kind of behind. Uh, so uh, typically is the absorption spectrum. And you can also do reflection or fluorescence. So going back to your question that uh, we kind of focused on absorption. But um, um, uh, again, mo while moving forward in the talk, we'll see that uh, you can also measure just a reflection from the surface. But if you re measure the reflection from the surface, then you are not using beard lambert law. Beard lambert law, light has to go through the material. And if you do a reflection by spectroscopy, you are just sending light and just measuring reflection part. And that's also we'll talk about heavily. But for this, mostly UVVs, this is the main purpose to study the absorption, electronic absorption, because of this H nu. So because our goal for UVVs, just again touch back so that we don't miss what is the essence. So this is the essence, essence to study electronic absorption. So less, because we will be studying so many spectroscopy if you still stay at the end of the three days. So, so I don't want to give you a wrong understanding. Uh, to just now, UVV spectroscopy to study this means how electronic absorption takes place. To absorption that takes place, you have to uh, make the material light go through the material. Then you measure absorption, right? So, so this is what we are behind, electronic transition. We are trying to know the electronic transition, delta E for UVVs because they are shorter wavelength, they can make, inf but now if you bring infrared light here, it, it can only go up to here, it cannot make infrared uh, uh, transition. For that we will talk about, we will do reflection measurement to study surfaces and there is some molecule here that, and see how is vibrational resonance changes. We cannot do the electronic study. So this is where behind for UVV. So you need to measure mostly transmission typically uh, using. So that's kind of what we're behind, measuring absorption. This is also, you can do it. Uh, we will touch up on that later, but um, that's not where behind in the uh, context. So you actually create intensity versus wavelength scan, and that's give you the spectrum. Uh, so now, again, touch back on application, uh, various organic and inorganic compounds, um, uh, lots of pigments um, in the fiber, your clothes, your hair. Uh, uh, you cannot believe how much spectroscopy goes into designing shampoo. So much. They just behind your hair, the shampoo company and conditioner company. They are just behind to make it look shiny. To make the shiny, they add even a silica particle on your, on your shampoo so that it's shiny. And the silica particle, they repel each other. That's what your hair looks like a fluffy, like a woman's lo looks bigger, more than they are normal hair density because they repel each other. So they coat your each strand with a silica particle. Think about those companies. They came out with such a solution to make your hair look bigger than your original hair count. So, so I'm saying spectroscopy plays a big role in the hair, fiber, uh, uh, pigment measurement, um, uh, many drugs. Uh, um, uh, uh, I don't know how to write illegal, but there are many illegal and legal drugs. And in Colombia, you don't talk about illegal drugs. So I'm saying that you can actually identify um, uh, many illegal uh, or legal, all kinds of drugs. Um, um, and then in all kinds of uh, liquids, you can do uh, lots of enzyme and uh, protein studies, uh, kind of. So I think um, we should take a break because I think people will fall asleep. Uh, this is a little harder. Uh, but this is the most exciting spectroscopy we'll be talking about. If you understand how a Fourier transfer inference spectroscopy works, and you can convince your high school student, which I will try my best to teach you, um, you will see that this gives you so much happiness if you understand how FTIR works. And it is full of physics. So that we'll go through.